Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. What a beautiful way to start the show. Sorry for people listening at home, uh, but we just started with a lot of uh, beautiful Miss Lola angelically in a ball resting. Right beside that feet. Yeah. What a beautiful way to start the show with Lola Cam. I love that. Friday morning, Lola Cam, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm melting already. What a great way to start. (laughs) Well, Good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 359, see, I got it right finally, of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yes, sometimes I have just another pretty face. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns, he, him, hey, Mr. B-Ray, and with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Corvin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. We have, uh, I, do we have extra time today, Mr. Grizzly? Uh, yeah, we can do, uh, I can do two hours this morning. I've been up okay. since 3 a.m. Okay. Yeah, you you did today what i did yesterday no 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 my dog woke me up at 3 a.m oh okay and by four i'm like okay i I think i really have to take her out because she's super anxious yeah she really had to go (laughs) gotcha so it was her way of telling me she'd come wake me up and just pant when she pants she's anxious and when she's anxious yes there's usually a reason i thought maybe she had a bad dream or whatever no no we gotta she normally when i take her out we get she sits in the elevator and doesn't move until I say okay and she did that when I said okay she practically ran through the glass doors like normally she'll I'll open the door and she'll stand at the top of the stairs and look about go down the first flight open the door outside stand at the top of the stairs look about take surveillance nope she literally ran all the way through so Gee. like oh yeah okay Miss Thing needed to do her thing so I've, I've learned how to communicate better with her when she comes and approaches me and is super panty and anxious she is anxious. She is having an anxiety moment, but it's because she needs to get out right now. Yeah. So I took her for a walk at 4 a.m. Yeah. 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 I can see that. I can see that. Ah, yes. Lola language. Exactly. Yes. Indeed. Yes. All right. And other than that, Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today? Um, I think it's good. Honestly, I think it's good. Um, you know. 3 a.m. wake up is, is normally one to destroy my mental health, but uh, I'm feeling pretty good right now. So it is Friday. You know, the weekend's just a few hours away for those of us who get weekends off. Not everybody does. I thankfully do. Um, mind you, tomorrow, uh, April 13th, will be the one year uh, since we met, since Bridget and I met. Um, a happenstance meeting one year ago tomorrow. So there we're going to go, go out and we're going to go out and celebrate a little bit of that. 
I wouldn't call it our anniversary. It was our meetiversary, if you will. Yes, yes. Um, our first date no, was nothing May 6th. says nothing says you're only allowed to have just one anniversary. Well, so, yeah. our, 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 as if we date, need a reason to celebrate. Yeah, our first date was May sixth, or was it seventh? Six or seventh? I'll have to check the calendar to be sure. But yeah, it's a year ago tomorrow that we met. So, oh yay! That's wonderful. Um, speaking of occasions, I didn't mention it on the show yesterday. I made a note to mention it and didn't mention it. Uh, but yesterday was uh, the end of Ramadan. Oh, uh, was it? Eid al-Fitr, I believe. Uh, that's how it's pronounced. But I may be wrong. Somebody please correct me if I mispronounce that. But uh, uh, I guess what we say is Eid Mubarak. I guess is the greeting, mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm understanding it correctly. Uh, if I made a mistake, I'm sorry, but my intentions are good. Uh, I hope that you, your feast, I believe it's called Iftar, um, yes. was wonderful and that uh, you were surrounded by uh, love and people you love being around with and people who love you and uh, that there was lots of joy and happiness. All right, and uh, as they say, may, be, may peace be upon you. So there you go. Uh, if we happen to have any uh, Muslim kits out there, um, just we're happy to share in your joy. Um, there we go. Uh, uh, Kit Linda says, I have observed that since Lola came, Mr. Grizzly's mental health report is more positive. Yeah. Doggies do that, right? That, that's exactly what Kit Ellen said. <laughs> just a second. Yeah, great minds. Great minds think alike. All right, kits and cubs. As I promised you, uh, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into the Prime Minister's testimony at uh, the pub. I keep on calling it the same thing. I keep, I keep on changing the name of it, <laughs> but let's just say the Foreign uh, Interference Public Commission. And uh, if I have that wrong, I'm sure there will be a uh, intrepid kit that will put it in the chat and give me the right one. Um, but the Prime Minister did appear, and uh, as I said, like I gave a little bit of a preview yesterday as to what happened, how it went down. I looked, looked at the first half. Uh, I watched the second half. Um, the second half did have two moments uh, that were particularly notable, uh, and I've uh, got them here for you uh, today. Uh, hopefully, we'll have time to get to, to all the things. Um, but for really interesting reasons, not, I don't know how, how the right word, but it's not what you would, not the reasons for which you would expect. Okay. In this type of thing, well, because you're thinking about getting at something and, and just, Things that were revealed and dynamics that were at play, and you get a sense uh, uh, from uh, other communities uh, how it is that they're seeing it. And it's kind of very interesting. Um, so I believe I gave you a clip, Mr. Grizzly. Uh, <clears throat> it's two hours and 54 minutes, so yes. what's the starting point? <laughs> so we're going to start at a... Um, Hmm. <laughs> um, I was going to start at a minute 29, but you know what? I talked a lot about that yesterday. So uh, the first question was the council, uh, the commission's lawyer asking the prime minister basically to give a lay of the land oh, yeah. in his impression. Um, see, the reason I want to play it for the kids is because it's to show just how well he is mastering the file. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, let, let is, let, let, let's do this. It starts at uh, 129 about. All right, hang on a second. And I will I'll show you the question and uh, the response. The questions are sometimes long. Okay, here we go. All right. I ask you to start today, Prime Minister, by asking a pretty general question, but nevertheless a fundamental one, which is, having been Prime Minister now since 2015, can you paint for the commission a picture of the foreign interference landscape uh, over your tenure as prime minister? And, I, and before you answer, I'll just put two sort of precisions on that. One is that we know foreign interference comes in all shapes and sizes, but the kind of foreign interference that interests us most today at this commission is obviously foreign interference in democratic processes and electoral uh, processes and institutions. 
Second, um, it goes without saying, but uh, in answering this question and all questions I pose to you, please stick to information that can be safely publicly disclosed. Indeed. Um, one of the things um, that we had grown concerned about uh, as a party when we were in opposition before the 2015 election was the lack of oversight by parliamentarians uh, into what was going on in our national security universe in this country. Um, example of the uh, Afghan de detainee documents where there wasn't a process whereby parliamentarians of different parties of opposition parties could examine uh, top secret material uh, was seen as a lacking that Canada had, certainly compared to our other Five Eyes partners, which is why in our 2015 campaign platform, we committed to creating uh, a national security and intelligence committee of parliamentarians, whereby parliamentarians of all different parties uh, would be sworn into the highest levels of uh, clearance to be able to oversee, verify, uh, and um, ascertain that everything that our national security agencies were doing was on the one hand compliant with Canadian values, rules, and the Charter, and on the other hand, doing everything necessary to keep Canadians safe. So we started in 2015 with a commitment to strengthen our national security institutions. We did that by the creation of uh, National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. We also combined a number of um, oversight organizations into NCIRA, which is a more um, judicial uh, or uh, academic or high level uh, oversight of our national security agencies, uh, as well as, you know, as we began to govern, strengthened our uh, various national security and intelligence agencies uh, and tools. Uh, one of the things I did is I changed our national security advisor to a national security and intelligence advisor because it's not just about security and obviously the work around intelligence was getting more and more complex and important and part of keeping Canadians safe. Over the course of that first mandate, um, we witnessed uh, the uh, significant uh, foreign interference allegations or threats during the 2016 uh, presidential election in the United States, where uh, Russia certainly through misinformation and disinformation online uh, attempted to interfere. Uh, but also, more interestingly, as a key example, in 2017, during the French presidential election, there was actually a moment in which uh, officials within the French governmental apparatus actually had to come out and tell uh, the citizens of France that a particular piece of information or news that was about to break was in fact uh, Russian disinformation and should not be uh, given any weight or heed. That got us to reflecting on whether or not Canada had a potential to intercede in an election campaign uh, if there was a, a significant threat of foreign interference impacting the ability of our elections to actually unfold in a free and fair way. Uh, so we uh, got to work on developing uh, such a mechanism here in Canada, which ended up being two mechanisms, both the site panel, the site uh, task force that allows uh, our security agencies to monitor very closely the goings on in the election, and the panel of five, uh, which is top civil servants who would have uh, the ability, if they deemed it necessary, to actually go public uh, or take other actions to ensure the uh, protection of our uh, democratic institutions and electoral processes from foreign interference. Um, one of the other examples of things that we've, uh, we did during that time in 2018, uh, when Canada hosted the G7 uh, leaders meeting in Charlevoix, Quebec, um, we actually brought forward and created the G7 rapid response mechanism, which was designed uh, to monitor and respond to uh, threats of misinformation and disinformation in uh, our democracies. Uh, a tool that has been 
um, successfully used over the past years since in a number of different occasions and indeed was uh, more recently actually strengthened uh, to weigh in a little more on uh, the democracies in Eastern Europe where we're seeing significant interference by uh, uh, Russians given the, the conflict in Ukraine. So you see here Calm, mm -hmm. gnosis file, can state, you know, specific things that were done because the claim here is that, you know, nothing was done at all. Right. Often, that's the one that you hear. Bodies that were created, reasons why, awareness of what was going on around in the world with regard to interference, and therefore, right? And now we are talking again, 2015. Right, mm -hmm. 2016, right after the U.S. election, in which Trumpito Citolini stood up one day and said, "Russia, if if you're listening, um, sure would be helpful if you found those emails." Yeah. Before mm -hmm. you know, eventually being someone who later on said, uh, "But first, to do us a favor, though." Yeah. So. Um, uh, <laughs> and then I have total immunity. So I total um, immunity. I didn't do anything wrong. I was the president. I didn't do anything wrong, but even if I did, I had total immunity. Jesus. So get off my ass. I can't make this up. <laughs> so just like the public order emergency commission, same type of performance. Mm -hmm. If you could call it performance. Right? But Calm, knows his facts, not flustered, uh, thoughtful, fulsome, right? Yeah, all, all the good things. Yeah. Um, I'd like you to uh, go to 1042, uh, Mr. Grizzly. Uh, I won't show the question that comes before uh, because essentially um, it's just basically a... Uh, yeah, it's kind of weird to not show the question. Go to seven twenty. Okay. I'm trying. I'm trying to find a ways. I'm trying to find ways to cut time to fit in the things that I want to fit in. Uh, this is a question that's going to take a while because uh, there's a clerk uh, that's uh, showing documents on a screen to which of when they're referring to documents, and sometimes they have to find the document and scroll up and find and find the paragraph that they're looking for. But uh, this continues to go on. Uh, to show what else the prime and what else was going on there at the time when prime when we're talking about uh, setting the table given the lay of the land okay let's just go to the clip then and the the conflict in ukraine okay thank you for that summary um what i'm going to try and get at now is uh the threats really to which all of this responds so we heard from minister gould this morning about the, the plan to protect Canada's democracy and, and what it was really designed to, to do, that, that process. Uh, Mr. Clerk, I'm going to ask you to pull up a document, uh, CAN 019496. So, Mr. Prime Minister, this is a document actually from 2017, so before this Commission's mandate per se, but it, it gives an idea, I think, of uh, the kind of information, or at least that was was uh, available to you at that time, and that's what I'm going to bring out here. So, if we, this is a memo that was written to you by David Morrison, your NSIA at the time, uh, and you received it in June 2017. So, the the top of that um, document there talks about the Chinese foreign in interference threat, and it says. The CSIS describes the PRC essentially as sophisticated, pervasive, persistent. There are other countries around, but the PRC is the big one. Mr. Clerk, if you can just scroll down a little bit more. Okay, um, scroll down, scroll down, I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going. Okay, there we go. 
So uh, on the third page here, you'll see Prime Minister, it talks about allies who are facing similar challenges and refers specifically to Australia, in which I believe what's explained there is they, uh, in Australia, it was found that agents of the Chinese government were donating millions of dollars across the political spectrum. So your NSIA is informing you of this. And keep scrolling down, please, Mr. Clerk, to the next page. And then brings it back to Canada. Um, Oh, sorry, scroll down a little bit more, please, Mr. Clerk, till the next page. BCO comments. There we go. Okay, last page. Politicians and elected officials, in particular at the provincial, territorial, and municipal levels, are largely unaware of the PRCs and others' efforts to influence Canada's political landscape, making them more vulnerable to these attempts, either in Canada or when traveling abroad. So there's that, and then scroll down just a little bit more, Mr. Clerk, so we can see the last part of this. Um, so this is, I'm sorry, I said it was David Morrison, it's actually Daniel Jean. This is a very sensitive issue, and public efforts to raise awareness should remain general and not single out specific countries to avoid potential bilateral incidents. However, countries across the line should be reminded of appropriate conduct and risk of consequences. So, Mr. Prime Minister, I'd like you to speak to those points, if you can. First of all, the level of knowledge about foreign interference, the level of threat here, we see it coming from the PRC, and also that tension between sort of exposing something about foreign interference while at the same time having to balance international relations, bilateral incidents, and the like. Um, well, first of all, it's a good example, as I spoke about the um, experiences in the United States and in France, uh, the experience that Australia had, uh, not with Russia, but with China, is uh, another excellent example that we were very aware of at the time, uh, and highlighted the fact that there are uh, foreign state actors who are uh, interested in playing a role in, in, uh, in our democracies or in disrupting our democracies. The difference between Russia and China is a significant one in that China has a, a, a very large a diaspora of Chinese Canadians who are uh, often the first uh, targets of interference uh, efforts by uh, a foreign state, uh, by that foreign state. So we were very aware of it as a politician in Canada for um, eight years when I became Prime Minister, uh, I was certainly aware of the various ways um, officials and different countries, particularly through diasporas, uh, can take an interest in Canadian political processes. But to understand it better, one of the first things we did uh, in 2015, maybe into 2016, uh, was request a briefing from uh, our national security officials that would uh, go at some of the things we had heard, some of the things we knew or uh, understood as opposition politicians now in a position of being in government, that we wanted to understand more about the role of foreign interference in particular communities. And you know, we even wanted to know about particular individuals that we had heard things about. Uh, and understand what landscape we were actually walking into because we suddenly had access to a very sophisticated and uh, excellent national security apparatus that when one is a simple opposition politician, you don't have access to. So from the very beginning, we knew there were things we needed to know about. Uh, and we got briefings on that, and this uh, 2017 memo is certainly a continuation of uh, that level of awareness. The issue of it being a sensitive issue uh, is, um, is quite germane, uh, and it evolves over time. Uh, back in the early days of our government, we were very much uh, looking to deepen the trade and commercial ties with China, uh, seeing it as an opportunity for exports. One of my biggest files of the day on that was trying to uh, restore the canola shipments that many uh, Western grain farmers were relying on uh, that were seeing um, irregular blockages uh, from the Chinese authorities. So that was part of our work. But even as we were doing that, we were very aware of the areas in which we needed to 
uh, challenge or contest China, whether it was on issues of human rights or democracy, of uh, Uyghurs, of uh, uh, protection uh, of the rights of our, uh, our diaspora communities from um, influence or intimidation. Uh, there has always been a complex approach that every government has had to take with China. Um, over the years, however, this has shifted significantly, um, as I'm sure we'll get into. Uh, the relations with China um, took a significant turn uh, when uh, they chose to arbitrarily detain two Canadian citizens. Uh, and for you know, close to three years, uh, we were um, not just um, pushing back hard against China on um, the arbitrary nature of those detentions and the fact that they needed to release those two Canadians. But we were extremely active around the world in mobilizing other countries to bring up uh, Canada and the plight of the two Michaels uh, during their bilateral conversations, which was something I can say um, ended up putting a significant amount of um, strain on our relationship because it was a massive irritant to China that everyone kept talking about these two Michaels even when uh, they didn't have anything to do with Canada. We heard it regularly, but that was what we would continue to do. Um, it perhaps came to the, the, the greatest sort of head in terms of um, being reminded of appropriate contact and risk of consequences. Uh, in uh, November of 2022, when I was in Indonesia for a G20 meeting, uh, where when I um, saw the president of China, Xi Jinping, at the um, opening ceremonies, I mentioned to him that I needed uh, China to stop um, interfering in Canadian democratic processes, because that was very much uh, something that uh, people were very concerned about that back home at that particular moment. Okay. All right, Mr. Grizzly. Um, we'll move then to the, from the general. So, very interesting bit of testimony there. Indeed. Right? So while there was stuff going on with Russia in certain parts of the world, there was stuff going on with China in other parts of the world, namely Australia. And um, one of the criticisms that the conservatives and that the media loves to make about the prime minister is that he was naive when it comes to China because he wanted to keep on doing business and was still trying to pursue business uh, to the last minute while other people were saying, you know, you got to be more careful. Um, and maybe that is true in the sense that, you know, his father opened up the door and he wanted to continue and China is incredible if we're just talking about pure capitalism and markets and dollars, great opportunity. But uh, this opportunity comes with issues and entanglements mm -hmm. and speed bumps and other things. So, um, you know, the thing to remember here is that what the prime minister did said from the moment that the detentions, the arbitrary detentions of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig became an issue, uh, this government really did stand up because the government of China, the Communist Party of China, tried to squeeze this economically with a whole bunch of different sanctions and got really, really upset when we were talking to our friends around the world to get them to talk about it too. So you better stop talking to people about us. We got those kind of, those kinds of statements too, and um, you know. And then there was that uh, meeting where uh, Chairman Xi thought he was going to scold the Prime Minister in public, and uh, the Prime Minister reminded him how things happen in a democracy. And uh, in a culture where uh, people love to save face, I'm sure that didn't go over well. So um, to suppose that the government of the time, at the time, favored liberals after they just got through government with Stephen Harper, where they got FIPA, mm -hmm. and they had Nixon sold to them, 
and we were looking at uh, bringing in more Huawei at the time. Um, I, um, I, I have a hard time believing that, especially since our government for three years, about a thousand days, defied the government of China when it was trying to impose China law in Canada when we detained Meng Wanzhou. <laughs> and I distinctly remember at the time people within the conservative movement saying that the prime minister should just let her go or that the prime minister should have given an order somehow to interfere with the police to say that the RCMP at the airport should have never just arrested her, just let her go by or customs officials. Oh, sorry, we didn't see her. Now she's your problem, United States. Or that we should just roll over and just let her go, which would be giving China exactly what it wanted, sending them the message that, hey, anytime you want something from us, just detain a couple of us and wait long enough. One of our parties will cave. So when you put all that together, if the government of China in 2019, 2021 did have a preference, I would suspect it was not the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. At best, I would suspect it was no preference at all. Because, you know, I mean, they did have problems with certain things that uh, Aaron O'Toole did in the campaign. That's why they targeted him. Of course. So, um, so it's not like um, it's not like well, the was, Conservative was, Party was hitting it out of the park with courting. No, no, that but he was trying to move it to a more person. progressive party and and less of yes. this social conservative uh, clickbait race. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, he yes. was really trying to bring it back to. Yes. A progressive, well, progressive is a, that's a stretch, but he was moving it now. Yes, he wanted to take a little step to the left. Yes, and they absolutely want no part of that because no. they're Christo fascist. Yes, but that's the, that's the whole other part we're talking about. With you know, after the election, one of the things in the postmortems was is that the uh, Chinese diaspora in Canada uh, felt that they couldn't vote for him because there was a campaign of information, mm -hmm. you know, like to say he's going to take away this from you or he's not going to let you do that. or And a lot of that happened in, you know, um, uh, Mandarin, I'm going to guess here, Mandarin or Cantonese in Canada and signage and in communications and that type of stuff. And so, yeah, yeah I hear you. you know, it, it, it's the dirty tricks. It's the dirty tricks. And, uh, you know, we don't... Uh, you know, we might be sitting there at one point going, ha ha, yay, conservatives, you got what you sow, mm -hmm. like this. But I mean, this this is stuff that shouldn't be happening. Yeah, I agree. It just should not be happening. Uh, so, but the other thing is that you notice that, that there's that China shift, right? Because the conservatives just like to say, you know, like, as he was naive, he didn't know what he was doing. And then, of course, they bring back that quote where he says, oh, yeah, besides the way he loves to just dictate that dictatorship, he would like to be like it, right? that whole quote that they take that they all forget the whole last end of it all the time to say that he's a dictator. Look, yeah, of course he's a dictator. He admires the basic dictatorship of China. He said so himself. Look at this quote that I truncated right here. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but you see this uh, very, very, very well uh, explains the, t the China shift here. And uh, one thing that uh, didn't get a lot of press, but uh, Canadians may not know, is that in 2021 there was an anniversary there was a declaration against arbitrary detention in state to state relations that was signed internationally and it was canada that spearheaded that as a result of what had happened to the two michaels so in addition to all the national security stuff like this canada spearheaded an initiative to have a declaration, an international declaration against arbitrary detention and state-to-state -state relations. Drafted, signed, and approved in 2021. 
Mm. We're not a big power. We're not like the United States. They do it or else we'll send in our people. But this is the kind of stuff that we do well. We tend to be really good at diplomacy. This is why we're valuable. We're, we're, we're also known as great peacemakers and, and wonderful peacekeepers. The International Landmines Treaty, that's also us. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Right? So this is the stuff we're good at. This is the value we add. So um, just an interesting, uh, again, so the, the prime minister really knows his facts and he knows his file and that type of stuff. And, you know, that's it. Well, the, um, the, the CBC story, just it, it, she says, it, uh, this is by Aaron, Aaron Weary and CBC. This was posted at 4 a.m. <laughs> just when I was getting up. I read it at the time, actually. It's a shame we didn't have Trudeau's testimony on foreign interference earlier, much earlier. Doubt about the democratic process thrives without clarity and information. Right. Right. I'll put a link in the chat for anybody who wants to, uh, to read the CBC article. It's well written. Yeah. Now, uh, for the next section, Mr. Grizzly, I'm going to have to give you another link. Please keep that one you have open somewhere. Okay. It's just that the next section, uh, the lawyer switches into French, and the prime minister answers in French, and on that uh, version that I have you, it doesn't have a simultaneous interpretation. And I would do it myself, but it's about nine minutes, so it would require us stopping every 20 seconds. That wouldn't be fun. <laughs> so so we'll I'm just starting go. at the H hour mark? At seven, seven hours, hours, 53 and 33. Yeah, wow. this one has the testimony of all four people that day in one big block. Okay. That's why it's so long. Did not know that. All right. Just give me a second here while I cue this up. Okay. I got it good to go. That took a, a little bit of work on my part because I'm kind of tired <laughs> so it's about a 10 minute clip there eh? yeah it's about like so minutes. The, this one has a, a the reason why and i wish it was in the original language because it would be better to hear the actual tone and inflection but it's a back and forth uh that's really interesting about how it, the process about how he gets information because this is the crux of it where all the conservatives are saying i can't believe you didn't get that information he says he wasn't informed of that and like this this is the prime minister explaining really how it happens okay well let me just uh switch tabs there we go so now let's move This is the video. The way that you receive information, uh, intelligence information, now in your interview and previous testimony, the written documents were not necessarily a reflection of the information you received. And in fact, it's the version main part of your briefings can you explain that to us and the video just the keeps way stopping. you receive uh, the information you need well first of all any prime minister receives countless briefings receives countless information not only on foreign interference or national security issues but on the economy or uh, public security issues, um, concerns shared by allies. I am constantly in receiving mode of all kinds of information from departments and advisors across government. I, of course, also follow the headlines to know what Canadians are reading about, hearing about, what they are concerned about in their daily lives. Now, all of this information is presented in different ways, but despite the fact that I receive written information, uh, briefs on intelligence. There's something going on with the video for some reason. It just keeps doing that. And oh, it's, it's not our video. The only 
make me aware of a priority issue. It's not right. our video. It's it's the source. Yeah, it's the source. Okay, and let's let's stop that. Or if it's yeah, because it's it's not the YouTube video. It's the original source that was doing that. Yeah, um, yeah, the original source. Yeah, the Globe and Mail's feed was terrible. It started terrible at the beginning. I figured they might have got it cleared up by the seventh hour, but I guess they no, didn't. they did not. Uh, okay, so uh. we'll just kill that one because it, it's just it ain't working. Oh <laughs> God, darn. Yeah. Least okay. Time. Um, so what I will do with that is I will, um, because it's important, it's the crux, it's the whole crux of the thing, how he receives information. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of people are trying to misrepresent the Prime Minister as saying, well, I don't read my stuff. Right? Um, simply not it, it, yeah no it's not the case but here's the thing is um the briefing notes that are prepared mm -hmm. are not briefing notes for the prime minister to read they're briefing notes for the people who are briefing the prime minister right so there's a whole bunch of text in the note yes but after that you know they're talking they're having a conversation so it's not like somebody necessarily puts the briefing note in front of the prime minister and says, here, read this. Anything that he gets that is written, gets some of that, you know. So if it's put in front of his face, he reads it. But what he said, what he's saying in there, in this full text is as a prime minister, essentially, you know, I could be pulled, be pulled from one place to another place and not necessarily have time to read something. If you want to be sure that information that needs to get to me gets to me, is it's always better to do it in either a face-to-face -face briefing or one over a secure phone line because you're actually stopping something that you're doing and taking time out of your day this rather than trying to read it between two things where you say okay i'm going to read it in the car between this and that between this and that something happens in some town that you have to develop a response to and then you don't have time to read it and then you go so you know a, a, a meeting goes a little late and all of a sudden you got to make up a few minutes whoops okay we're not going to read that right now so uh so somebody else reads it and briefs you on the way or that type of stuff but these briefing notes so it's a lot of people are trying to make this look like the prime minister's oh well the prime minister i don't read my stuff or i was like it's or I don't care enough to read my stuff for that type of stuff. That's not what's going on. Mm -hmm. yes. And then there's another part where they're talking about how um, intelligence is not evidence. And sometimes you need to push back on the intelligence because you know something, for example, you know, that that's not consistent with it. Or, you know, or you say, well, you know what, this is not corroborated enough that I can't do anything with this as it is. So, you know, uh, can you go find out this about this? Like, and then again, you know, are you able to disclose it? <laughs> of course, at that point. So um, it, it really, he really talks about how it, how it happens in real life, basically. So, all these things when you're you're sitting at home and you're thinking like this well of course he yeah, knows absolutely everything it's like was no not necessarily because all along the only the stuff that gets to him is only the stuff that he absolutely critically must know is and the stuff that absolutely for sure gets to him is the stuff that he must know so badly that someone will say mr prime minister you need to yes. take time out of your day to stop to listen to this. This needs to be addressed immediately. <laughs> right? You can't brief him with every damn thing. That's just not realistic. You know no, no, exactly. Right. Like and, and here's so, the thing between intel and evidence. They're two different things. Oh, yeah. Intel is not evidence. No, no. It's not. Like this, the, the, the burden, the level of proof, you know, it's like uh, intel is very nice, but intel would never stand up in court. No. Because it's just intel. It's got to be sorted through. It's got to be corroborated. It's got to be authenticated. It's intel. Yeah, but intel, however, you know, if there are pattern behaviors and stuff like that, allows you to act a little, a little quicker. Yes, this is true. Right? You might see something coming. So, so you know, that's why it's very important. So, uh, hopefully, uh, maybe something I'll be able to do is uh, check it out over the weekend, maybe, and uh, come up with a translation myself and... Uh, 
might be an easier way to do it. But th that's essentially the gist of it, uh, kids. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, section didn't work. Uh, so if we're going back to the old one. Just a second. Okay. Um, let's go to 4933. Because this is sort of in the uh, the same vein. It's a later question uh, that comes up. But the Prime Minister mentioned something with regard to all of this um, that's relevant. So I, I won't have the first answer, but I will have the, You'll get a little bit of it through this. Okay. Here we go. Who would be able to brief me on this? Okay. Um... Speaking of briefings, we're going to turn to that topic now. So I'm going to go through a few briefings that we know uh, you or we think you received. We do know you, that you received in many instances on foreign interference over the relevant time period. I'll start with um, February 9th, 2021. This one I don't really have a document to point you to, so I'm just going to ask you for your recollection of it. So this would be, again, February 20, February 9th, I'm sorry, 2021. Do you recall receiving a briefing on that date? Uh, yes, uh, that was uh, a briefing uh, that I got on uh, on the phone. I was not uh, not in person for that briefing. I was there via uh, teleconference on on a secure phone. And uh, yes, I got a briefing. Okay. Do you recall the content of that briefing at all? It was a, as I recall, a a, a general briefing on a number of uh, issues including foreign interference. Okay. The next one then in time skips to the fall of 2022. Mr. Clerk, can you pull up CAN 015842, please? Okay, this document, which has been talked about quite a bit in these proceedings is briefing notes to the director of CSIS. And Mr. Clerk, again, can you scroll down just so the Prime Minister can see a bit of the document and its content? So Prime Minister, my first question is, you, you do you remember getting this briefing in the fall of 2022, October 27th? Yes, my memory is always better when, I'm, when I was physically in the place where I got the briefing. So I, uh, I remember very clearly this briefing. Um, this briefing was actually an overview of a number of different uh, cases and situations, uh, none of which uh, had to do with federal elections. Okay, so would you say that the content of this particular, these notes, these briefing notes, accurately conveys what you were told during uh, that briefing? Not particularly. Um, obviously, uh, there are elements uh, in this that are um, consistent with the briefing that was uh, on different elements of foreign interference. Uh, but... When it comes to briefings, uh, and others uh, can speak to this and how they make decisions about what to read from their prepared notes during an actual briefing uh, with, uh, with uh, ministers or, or, or prime minister. Um, but it is much more of a... A conversation than someone reading a prepared text to what to to uh, the minister that they're briefing. Um, yeah, there are elements in here that say, for example, in the, having read the briefing note uh, in preparation for this uh, uh, this inquiry, um, that talk about how serious foreign uh, foreign interference is and how uh, we need to do more. That wouldn't have been something that. Uh, the CSIS director or the national security advisors or whoever would have had to spend much time on because they would have known that we did understand how serious foreign interference is and how much we take it seriously. And actually that was 
why we would spend more time on specific cases or concerns that were really the meat of the briefing. So um, while notes are prepared for the briefers, what actually becomes the most important thing that I certainly recall about those briefings was the various and specific cases we went through and how they are examples of concern or not concern that we then have to behave in certain ways or have follow-ups on this or that. I mean, it is much less a large theoretical briefing and much more concrete. This is a situation and then the discussion about how we deal with this particular situation or example or another would be where the the larger theoretical discussion and implications would come in, but they would be concentrated around specific uh, individuals or cases. Okay. So maybe we'll pull up now uh, Ms. Telsford's notes from that meeting. So that's CAN 009803. There you go. <laughs> Having issues on my end here. Lots of stuff going on. <laughs> so uh, you see again, uh, sort of the, the precise how it really happens uh, when you're when you're in the moment, when you're in the meeting, how a briefing actually goes down. So this is mm -hmm. the, the sort of the behind the scenes stuff when you hear people at home going, "So I can't believe he doesn't know this." Or like this. Well, this is how it happens. You know, it's not somebody puts a book in front of you. And you go, "Well, here's everything that you need to know. Read it." It's you know this thing happen. Oh, well, what about this thing? Well, who did that? Why did that? How do we know this? What's the right, what's the reliability of this information? Like this, how can we make this relationship, this, this information more reliable, this knowledge, what else can you find out when, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's those types of conversations that end up happening at that point. Um, so just one of the things that we found very interesting about the Public Order Emergency Commission was all the dialogue going on between all the people and how things were going down. You say, oh my God, this is how it really works. You know, and sometimes we say, oh my God, that was really efficient. And then and the other, and other times we're looking at, looking at and going, wow, these people are super dysfunctional. Yeah. <laughs> like at the Ottawa police, for example. Oh, yeah. Right? So, um, now the other thing point is because this uh, came up a lot uh, it's the whole issue with handong yeah it's um hmm it, it's right. a complex one for sure yeah I, i've been reading about it this morning when i was up at 4 a.m and i don't have an opinion on it yet because I, uh, there's more information i need to form a, a an informed intelligent opinion some of it is a little bit um pardon yeah. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. It, uh, you know, like complex, convoluted, complicated. Yeah. Now, so this one starts at 2518. Now, one of the issues with the Handong that came up in the, during his testimony of Handong was that there were um, people that were bust mm -hmm. to his nomination uh, yes. race on voting day. And uh, it seems that it was school children because it seems that in nomination races, and I'm not sure if this is true for all parties because, uh, all, again, political parties are private organizations, and I don't know if anybody's asking the question, but they certainly are not volunteering the information. It seems that, uh, whereas, uh, for example, in an election, you have to be of a certain age and you have to be a Canadian citizen. Right. Uh, in a party nomination, you do not need to have to be of a certain age and you can be a permanent resident, but not a Canadian citizen, which means, for example, 14 year olds mm -hmm. can vote. Which is very interesting. Uh, in nomination races, but not in general elections, which means uh, we basically, uh, the rules when it comes to party nominations are just wide open for corruption clearly wide open uh now busing people to nomination races is not odd in and of itself no that's quite commonplace actually that happens right away um busing uh, a busload of people of one diaspora in a nomination race also not weird no 
prime minister mentioned that in his own writing, you know, there's a heavy, there's a big Greek population, there's a big Italian population, right? Um, you know, they have certain writings that have a, a greater sick population, and it is sick. I finally heard it because in, there was a lawyer from a, <laughs> a sick group that was there and identified <laughs> the name of his group, and it is sick. So now I know. So that's the one I'm sticking with. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, um, how do you put it? Uh, it's no, easy to go down the, 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 the language and the ethnicity trope, right? So you're saying, oh, they brought in a bus of Chinese students. Oh my God, that's so terrible. Like this, you know, you're, you're this, but it's not the fact that this that they're Chinese it's the fact that they're students right mm -hmm. it's the fact that something was organized to bring them in right that's where it looks a little nefarious yes and if we're talking I about we really form an opinion on this yet I yeah. just I don't have enough yeah. to, to if we're talking about China and we're talking about, let's say that this is a bus of kids that were not at least 18. Mm -hmm. uh, the it's suspect. For, for, it, it, uh, right? It's, it's suspect. It's, and that's why, you know, I need more info. Yeah. Now, of course. It doesn't look good. <laughs> of course, this is something that can be done with no knowledge whatsoever of the candidate. The issue is, is that seems that there were talks between the candidate and the embassy of some type of things. And that's where we're getting that, uh, that uh, disclosure that one of them was intercepted when allegedly, or some people are trying to interpret it as Mr. Uh, Dong, tried to encourage the government of China to keep uh, the two Michaels uh, detained longer. Um, and then there was an issue where people were saying, well, no, there's something, there was something that was lost in translation there. So the bus revelation is a new one. And it seems that there was an interaction between Mr. Dong and that school itself. Um, but that's about all. That's about all I know. I don't know what you know. Did they ask him to to stop in there as a candidate would stop in a school because you know candidates do talk to people who don't have the ability to vote yet. Yes, because they're looking to reel them in the future, the next generation of voters. Right. right? I guess, or just you know, instill democracy, or you know, so. Uh, it, it, it's it's a little messy it's a little messy but well let's let's just go to the clip there so that, that's sort of just some overall context for the hangdong thing but okay. that's how the prime minister answers the, the question because then again right the the whole conservative narrative is that oh my god i can't believe this you know these things work like this and it's so simple and it's like yeah well it's not not so much simple yeah okay hang on we'll go to the clip and uh it, it yeah just just give it a watch some of that as we go along um i'm gonna take you to the 2019 election now specifically mr clerk can you pull up uh can double zero five four six one please So, Prime Minister, this is, while well, it's getting pulled up, yep, there it is. Um, we know at this point in the uh, the evidence before the Commission that uh, on September 28th, 2019, um, the Site Task Force and CSIS gave a briefing to uh, the security cleared representative of the Liberal Party about foreign interference in the Don Valley North riding. We also know from Mr. Broadhurst that he then received that information. <laughs> How did this play out from your perspective? Uh, 
late in September, uh, as I was coming through Ottawa, um, I believe I was on my way out uh, across the country for a, a, another stretch of campaigning. Um, I believe it was on a Sunday as I was, I was heading out after Saturday with, uh, with my family. Uh, Mr. Broadhurst um, met me at the airport uh, in a uh, holding room, in a lounge uh, on the, uh, the um, government side of the airport, government terminal in the airport. Uh, to let me know of concerns that he had received from the site task force and uh, CSIS about the nomination campaign, the nomination uh, election, um, the nomination race contest in uh, Don Valley North. He shared with me um, that the intelligence services had shared with him concerns that Chinese officials in Canada had been um, developing plans to possibly engage in interference in the nomination contest, uh, specifically uh, by mobilizing buses uh, filled with and I'm, it, the challenge in this is always trying to pick out what I heard exactly then from what I knew later, but I believe it was either buses full of students or buses filled with Chinese speakers or Chinese diaspora members who would be mobilized uh, to support Han Dong, uh, who would have been mobilized to support Han Dong uh, in that nomination uh, contest of a few weeks previous. Uh, in what ended up being probably a 20-minute to half-hour conversation with Mr. Broadhurst, I asked him uh, more specifically about, um, okay, so they had plans or an intent or a capacity to do this. Do we know that they did? Did you hear from CSIS and, and the security agencies that this was actually done? Um, he, they weren't entirely certain. There was reasons to believe that perhaps it has and perhaps there were the indication was that there were buses uh, filled with Chinese speakers uh, at that nomination contest. Um, I asked if, and, and as a matter of course those who are in uh, politics and certainly uh, on the ground riding politics know that it is regular for buses to be mobilized in particularly in contested nominations of community organizations, uh, uh, student groups, uh, you know, a particular uh, seniors residents could you know, bring a, a mini bus full of seniors to participate in, in a nomination contest. So just the existence of buses wasn't enough, buses with uh, Chinese speakers or Mandarin speakers in them wasn't enough to um, be itself uh, alarming or, or a, 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 a condemnation, but it was, there were clear indications that there were concerns by CSIS that China might have been behind this, um, and that those students or those individuals on the bus might have been motivated uh, or brought, mobilized to vote in that way, and these, there were concerns that CSIS had. I asked, um, the extent to which they were certain that it happened, the extent to which they were certain that China was indeed behind the mobilizing of the bus or buses. And I also asked uh, whether or not CSIS had information that Han Dong knew about this, whether he was a witting and aware that China had mobilized or Chinese officials had mobilized buses for him or not. And the answers, answers were not clear from CSIS at that point, uh, according to what Mr. Broadhurst told me. I then uh, asked, I also asked if, um, if it was a close nomination, if there was a sense that the actual result of the nomination uh, could have been affected 
by this bus or buses or what was there, and that wasn't clear at all. CSIS didn't have any conclusions to share at that point. Um, I asked Mr. Broadhurst uh, whether CSIS was making any uh, recommendations or uh, suggestions as to what we should do with this information. And it was clear um, to Mr. Broadhurst that this was very much about just letting us know so that we know and could perhaps um, take any actions that we deemed um, appropriate, but they weren't going to be recommending for us to take action of one way or a, a, another. But they also specified uh, that um, this was uh, secret information that we could not share with the candidate in question, Mr. Dong, uh, or the public at large uh, in terms of, of what they were telling us about these concerns and this allega these allegations. I then asked Mr. Broadhurst um, what the Liberal Party processes that are in place to oversee nominations, particularly contested nominations, had flagged around that nomination contest of a few weeks before. Um, there are party officials that oversee uh, the voting, the registrations, the voting, the processes, the counting. There are lawyers in place overseeing the count. Uh, there are possibilities for the losing contestant or contestants uh, to challenge uh, the result if they feel it was unfair. There are many processes because um, political parties often have some very uh, complex uh, fights around nomination uh, parties, all uh, nomination contests, all political parties are like that. Um, and Mr. Broadhurst uh, assured me that they had looked into when they heard uh, these allegations or this information from CSIS uh, and CITE and had no flags on the nomination process. Um, so then I had uh, uh, what was a brief conversation with Mr. Broadhurst uh, after we had established all that um, to sort of agree that the threshold for overturning a democratic event like an official party nomination to find out who would be the candidate for a general election, um, particularly during an election, general election, um, must have a fairly high threshold for removal of that candidate. And that was really sort of the binary choice uh, we were placed with in that situation. Acting would be removing Han Dong as our official candidate. Um, the other choice would be not to remove that candidate. But even not having removed that candidate, it would be something given this information that we would have to revisit. Certainly in the case that that candidate got elected, there would be questions we would have to follow up on um, after the election to properly understand what, uh, what happened and what, what the issues or the risks were in this situation. So but understanding that the decision to um, remove someone needed a high threshold, a threshold that incidentally I have um, met and seen many other cases. As Liberal Party leader, I have uh, on many, many different occasions uh, had to uh, ask people to step down or step away or desist as candidates for the Liberal Party. It's most recently as the last election where we did that in the, in the case of uh, a downtown Toronto riding. Um, but in this case, I didn't feel that there was sufficient or sufficiently credible information that, that would justify this um, very significant step as to um, remove a candidate uh, in these circumstances. So where does that leave you? So you don't exercise that option, and you put it as a pretty binary choice there. But you have this information, you receive this information, it's, as you say, classified information that you can't share. What are you able to do? Where does this leave a political party receiving this information? Um, well, it meant that after the election, when we were out of 
caretaker period where I went back to being primarily prime minister and not um, simply leader of a political party with uh, 338 candidates across the country, um, I was able to turn to our um, intelligence agencies and say, uh, we need to knew, know more about this. Uh, we need to understand what the context is because the answers that we get on that will have a bearing on choices we could make in the future about uh, different uh, roles or responsibilities for a, an individual in a, uh, such a situation. Okay. Um, can move All right. Am I? Yeah, you're good. You're okay, good. no, you normally you mute, you, mute, you normally you mute me during video, so I didn't see the thing pop up on the screen, so I didn't know if I was on yet. Yeah, no. <laughs> I didn't need to uh, mute at that time. There was no noise, so I, okay. I mute if I hear noise. Okay, I'll have to um, edit this out of the audio. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you can see here, uh, right uh, again, good detail uh, uh, as to how things happen, and there was something in that answer that the Prime Minister mentioned that is very, very important uh, that didn't get a lot of play. And uh, maybe people are not aware, but once we, once the Prime Minister goes to the Governor General to ask to declare an election period, the government technically no longer is the government. We go into a caretaker mode where the public service takes over. Right. That's why the government can't make any more spending announcements or, you know, there's a period of time they can't make spending amounts announcements or sign treaties or make big international, you know, just as they're on their way out or something like that, or during the election period itself. Uh, you know, if there's a, if there's a, you're in a, during an election, let's say there's a wildfire campaign, stuff like that, the stuff that the government must do must be done and somebody, and maybe somebody from the government, the minister from the government will announce it specifically. But there are going to be extremely, really, really tight rules as to how that can be used because you're in an election campaign. And sometimes it won't even be someone from the government, sometimes it will be an appointed person in that case, right? Um, so when they're in caretaker mode during the elections, the prime minister is not being briefed by national security, national intelligence, because he's not the prime minister. He's the leader of the Liberal Party of Canada mm -hmm. during the election campaign. That's right. Right. So this Mr. Broadhurst person that the prime minister is talking about because he's the one, he's a designated person from the Liberal Party who has the security clearance. And he's the one that gets the briefing and brings it back to the Prime Minister during the mm -hmm. election campaign. And then when the election's over and the Prime Minister won again, then he becomes the Prime Minister again. And then he goes back to getting his briefings from the national intelligence. So early on in the answers when he was talking about the body of five, the five very senior public officials, public servants, that's there specifically and that body works specifically during the election campaign in case there's something like he mentioned in the election in, that happened in france that there was a piece of misinformation foreign generated by russia let's say in that case in france that was being circulated that was indicating that there was going to be some type of scandalous thing and people were going to run with that and that this their body decided Everybody in France, this is going to be coming out. You need to know somebody's trying to screw with you. I guess we're an independent panel. We see this. We see it coming down the pike. Watch out for this. This is not real. Right? So we have that similar body. Because, because you don't want the government or the incumbent government being the one that determines that during the election campaign. Right? And we saw it in the States as well with James Comey. Where he came up and you know talked about mm -hmm. some details of an investigation and campaign. Some people say it, some people say it changed the campaign, some people say it doesn't, but it was a pivotal moment. These types of uh, moments, if they do happen in a campaign, are extremely sensitive and you certainly do not want to have, have it be the person that risks having the benefit of knowing that information and using it or dispensing it in a specific way or at a specific time 
being the one that determines whether or not that goes public or not. Mm -hmm. And though you may want it if the party that you favor is in government at the time to block the party you don't want, you don't want that to be a thing because eventually the party you don't want is the government. And you don't want them having that power. Right? That's the check and balance. If you don't want it done to you, don't do it. <laughs> um, mm, now I'll bring, I want you to, we're going to go a little further up. Uh, this is the questions being asked to the prime minister from the other councils. Mm -hmm. There's more stuff from this that would be interesting in terms of process, but you're getting the general idea here mm -hmm. and the key important parts about, you know, how you get information and how all these things that the conservatives are saying, oh my God, it's unbelievable that, well, yeah, clearly it's very believable. It's totally believable. Totally believable. All right. So the first clip I have for you is at uh, two hours and 24 seconds, uh, Mr. Grizzly. Um, and it has something to do, it's a council for Aaron O'Toole. So all the councillors that were there, there was council for Michael Chong, there's council for Jenny Kwan, and there was council for Aaron O'Toole. Those were three MPs who had received personal briefings okay. that they had been targeted or singled out in some way, according to the or national intelligence had spotted that. So to uh, Hang Dong being one liberal, the, the one that we know, and then the other three, two conservatives and one NDP. So this was um, equal opportunity. Okay. Right, uh, effort on, on that part. Uh, so, and then, uh, so Michael Chan, Jenny Kwong, Aaron O'Toole, and then there was Council for the Conservative Party of Canada, a Council for Han Dong, Council for the Human Rights Commission, a Council for Sikh Coalition uh, mm -hmm. in Canada, Council for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, and then Council for, because uh, um, he had delivered his uh, question in French, Alliance des Canadiens Russes, but uh, the uh, Alliance, Alliance of Russian Canadians. Okay. Uh, so those were the, the, the groups that got standing. So this is the Council for Aaron O'Toole. Thank you, Prime Minister. Or thank you, Commissioner. Prime Minister, my name is Tom Jarman. I represent Aaron O'Toole. Uh, just building on a question that my uh, colleague was asking, uh, Mr. O'Toole, similar to Ms. Kwan, has also received a defensive briefing from CSIS. Um, and was that done with the permission or direction of your office? Um, again, it is not something that uh, CSIS needs to get permission from uh, the Prime Minister's office to do, uh, but in this case, we certainly uh, uh, encouraged it. Yeah. And has your office given general direction that when MPs come under this sort of, uh, I guess, scrutiny or attack, that uh, they should be made aware of that? Uh, that is, in, in general, our approach on things, yes. But yet, has your office given direction to that effect? Um, it is not to us to direct CSIS on uh, what threat reduction or defensive briefings it gives or doesn't give, uh, but certainly our posture has been one of uh, encouraging uh, CSIS to keep all parliamentarians uh, informed and, and aware of uh, not just threats against them, but of, of issues of foreign interference. Okay, so that's a very important segment again, because once again, the government does not direct. Those of us who are in the know understand this already, but yes. it needs to be stated and said. Exactly. It needs to be stated and said, shouted from the rooftops, if you will, so people will understand how things work. Yes. So it's not like the government comes and says, we found this stuff up out about Aaron O'Toole. Let's say they even say it's about Aaron O'Toole. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't even say who it's about. There's a member of an opposition party, that, and that's all the detail as they can give at the moment as, as to who the target is, and sometimes they can give more. But let's say they say specifically Aaron O'Toole, because they're not sitting there going, should we tell them? Yeah. Right. They're not, they're not, they're not asking. They're telling you that this happened. And if they feel the need that it's bad enough that they need to tell them, they have full authority to tell them on his own. They don't need the prime minister's permission. 
if they determine it's re reached a level that the candidate should know, they should know. But the prime minister says that he's encouraged them to let him know. Comes up, you know, it's like, and uh, since then, we know that there have been some uh, rules change and policy changes to make it such now that uh, the threshold for informing uh, candidates when it is that they've been targeted is uh, lower now. So to be sure that they have that information. So that change has already been made. Uh, but it's still, it's good to make, make it very clear. Um, the other clip is at uh, 233.45, Mr. Grizzly. One second. And this is from, um, this is the one of the two clips. The two clips that ended up being really interesting for me was the one from the Sikh Coalition and the one with uh, the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress because uh, our Prime Minister does some very, very interesting things that make my little communicator heart happy okay. in his responses. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of time, but I want to start by asking... Uh, whether you would agree that your government missed key opportunities to hold India to account for its interference in Canada, and, and to be more specific, um, so we can narrow down a concise answer, that there were attempts made by the government to minimize the threat that India posed throughout this relevant period, and actually tried to hide the severity of the threat uh, from Canadians. Would you agree with that assessment? No. Mr. Operator, if we can bring up COM155. So, Mr. Trudeau, this is a, a copy of the 2019 annual report of the NSI COP, uh, which you mentioned was a body created by your government um, in the hopes of creating some oversight and transparency on security and intelligence issues. Uh, Mr. Operator, if we can go to page 73 of the PDF. So as you know, this report uh, deals with uh, concerns about foreign interference. Is that 73 of the PDF? Or yeah, 55 of the actual document. And so this is a, a section that deals with foreign interference specifically. And if we can continue to scroll down until 79, please. You can go a little bit faster. <laughs> Go to 79. You don't need to take your time, brother. Just get there. And so, oh, right there, if you can hold for a second. If you scroll up, please. So there is mention specifically of, of foreign interference by the People's Republic of China. And continue scrolling. There's mention of the Russian Federation. And if we can pause right there. And it specifically says other states engaged in foreign interference. And if you continue scrolling... That entire section has been redacted. Mm -hmm. Mr. Operator, if we can go to page 108 of the PDF. And if you continue scrolling until 113, you see it, it, these are instances of Canada's response to foreign interference in relation to China. And then it goes into instance, instances of uh, a response to Russian interference. And if we scroll down, and this entire section, again, uh, is redacted. So, Mr. Trudeau, mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest that the redacted sections of this report outline details of Indian electoral interference and coercive activities against the Sikh community, as well as outlining governmental failures in combating this specific threat. Okay. And, so, and so, I, I, so I understand that you may not be able to uh, address this in a public setting for national security reasons. And if that's the case, you can indicate that to, to the commissioner. Um, so can you confirm that that is the substance that's been redacted in this report? Um, obviously, in a public setting, I can't speak to redactions made for national security. But I, I will say that the principle that anyone who comes to Canada from anywhere in the world uh, has all the rights of a Canadian uh, to be free from uh, extortion, coercion, um, interference uh, from a country that they left behind. Uh, and how we have stood up for Canadians, including uh, in the very serious uh, case that I brought forward to Parliament of the killing of, uh, of Nijar, um, demonstrates our government's commitment to uh, defending the rights and freedoms of Canadians for whom, uh, if, which are the reasons for which so many people uh, crossed oceans and continents 
uh, to come live in this country and build this country. And the suggestion that uh, we haven't and we won't do everything we can to defend Canadian rules and values and defend Canadians from foreign interference is uh, simply misplaced. And, and so I take your point there, and I have very limited time, but I do want to confirm that it was you that approved the redactions in this report. Is that correct? Redact based, on, based on suggestions uh, from public servants that you received. Redactions are made uh, by professional public servants, uh, and uh, we sign off on them, but we do not modify them. Uh, but you do have the authority, to, the ultimate approval, and you do have the possibility to push back against excessive redactions. Redactions are made by professional public servants, not by the political wing. And, and does the Prime Minister have the authority to push back on the suggestions that are made in cases where there may be excessive redactions? That gets into the entire question of uh, declassification of information, and in the American system, uh, the president can, you know, declassify uh, in ways that uh, are not replicated in our system here in Canada. So just very simply, I have one last question I want to ask after this. Does the prime minister have the authority and the ability to push back against those suggestions when there's excessive redaction? The prime minister uh, has an uh, ability to engage in discussions uh, and uh, ask for reasons. But like I said, as, uh, as Prime Minister and as uh, a government, our uh, habit and our uh, approach has always been uh, to allow the professional public service to make determinations around what needs to be re redacted in the name of national security and confidentiality. Uh, Madam Commissioner, I have one final question, if that's okay. Uh very quick. Sure. I, I think you would agree that the lack of meaningful steps to expose and stop foreign interference activities when they first arise, uh, including deliberate actions to redact any failures that may have been included in the NSI COP report, uh, could play a role in India's increasingly aggressive interference and repressive, uh, repression activities over this period. So that would be a consequence of failing to act uh, effectively and failing to bring the threat of Indian foreign interference uh, to the Canadians' attention earlier. Is that correct? I think that's certainly a question one needs to ask of the previous Conservative government that was known for its very cosy relationship with the uh, current Indian government, uh, whereas our government has always stood up to defend the minorities in Canada and the <laughs> rights uh, of minorities to speak out, even if it uh, irritates uh, their home countries overseas. Thank you. Well, that's, um, I thought that was quite, um, <laughs> yeah, y you know, it's, it, it's you know who I'd love to see get on the stand and get cross-examined would be Jeff, but that's not going to happen because he's not party to any of the information because he doesn't have his Nisikop clearance. They can't question the, lawyer, the leader of the opposition because he's not cleared to see any of the information. Mm -hmm. he, he he has the right to see what we see. That's it. Yep. Now, that was the most contentious line mm -hmm. of questioning. But the lawyer from the Conservative Party of Canada had, like, nothing memorable at all to really ask. I, I don't even James really know specifically right why it was. Cheap grandstanding. That's all that was. Yeah. But... He kept asking the same question over and over again and kept getting the same answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But... The first answer, the question was so loaded that the Prime Minister all had to say was no. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, but then when it came the opportunity to come in, he was able to speak to the community mm -hmm. specifically and about the importance of it. Because, and then at the end, throw in that little dig. <laughs> Just slid it in there, nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, love that. That was... That's that. That's one of that. Like, wait a minute. Did he just? Did he just decapitate me? And I didn't feel it. Yeah, I think he did. I, 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 yeah, uh, and the next one continues right after because the next one is the council for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, and this one's interesting as well. The Prime Minister uh, uh, nails the dispent on this one as well, I believe. Just pick up right where we left off. Just pick up right where we left off. Okay. All right. Let me just back it up for like five seconds. So we're back it up. Back it up. up, up. 
Okay, here we go. We'll just pick it up from right here. Their home countries overseas. Thank you. Those are all my questions. So, Mr. Dudi, it's your turn. Good evening, Prime Minister. That's uh, John Dudi. I'm counsel for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Uh, we've heard uh, that Russia's foreign interference activities in foreign elections was the catalyst for the plan to protect Canada's democracy and that Russia was a foreign nation that the Canadian government was concerned could potentially interfere in Canadian elections, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, we've also heard from the site task force and the panel of five that neither identified any foreign interference activity by Russia in either the 2019 or the 21 general election. It would seem possible that Russia was not interested in interfering with Canadian elections in those years, or equally possible that they did and the Canadian government failed to detect it. Would you agree that it's possible that Russia interfered in one or both the elections and the Canadian government simply failed to notice it? I would highlight that, of course, um, it is always possible that the entire body of our national security intelligence agencies are um, very sophisticated cyber uh, uh, and security uh, communications establishment um, detected absolutely nothing um, or got, got it wrong. But I would also suggest that um, Undermining Canadians' confidence in their elections being free and fair is probably something that Russia would love to see uh, in Canada. So I would be very wary about saying that, oh, you know, despite the fact you didn't find any evidence of it, it still might have happened. I think we have seen the extent to which Russia is engaged in misinformation, disinformation, and actions of, of, uh, of sowing chaos and destabilizing democracies around the world, including uh, attempts at cyber uh, attacks and, and successful cyber attacks in Canada. Um, but I think one of the big differences between Russia and a number of other hostile or challenging state actors uh, is the significant lack of um, a, a critical mass of either uh, Russian diaspora or um, Russian speakers in Canada, as you contrast with the situation in Ukraine or in Latvia or elsewhere, where uh, there is a, a, an easier threshold for them to interfere in uh, democratic processes. You spoke about the need for Canadians to be confident that the government is doing what it can to keep Canadians safe. How confident are you in the site task force and the panel of five's conclusion that Russia did not interfere with either election? Um, we know Russia is responsible for significant amounts of propaganda, of misinformation, of disinformation, and uh, certainly attempts at interference are uh, no doubt uh, ongoing from Russia. They are a hostile actor, hostile to Canada, hostile to our values, hostile to our support of Ukraine, uh, and hostile to our democracy. But to say, to reach a threshold at which there is a belief that Russia posed a threat to the integrity of our elections, to the outcome of our elections, uh, is certainly not something that either the site or the panel um, determined. And finally, would you expect members of the Canadian Ukrainian community to have a high level of confidence in that conclusion as well? Yes, I think the Canadian Ukrainian community, like all Canadians, can have a high degree of confidence in the conclusions by all of our national security experts and top public servants that the elections in 2019 and 2021 are free and fair. At the same time, I think Ukrainian Canadians, like all Canadians, need to remain vigilant to Russian disinformation and to the amplification of pro-Russian narratives in 
contexts and coming from places that one wouldn't suspect uh, pro-Russian narratives to be amplified. I'm very pleased to see that Ukraine just passed the updated Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement uh, yeah, over the past days, uh, and I am continue to be bewildered at the fact that the Conservative Party uh, voted against uh, that update because they fell prey to uh, pro-Russian narratives that are uh, undermining Canada's support for Ukraine amongst Conservative Canadians, which I know is uh, a thing of deep distress for many Ukrainian Canadians, and rightly so. Thank you, Prime Minister. Merci. Spicy. Just a little spicy there. So, yeah, Prime Minister took advantage of his time to to drop a couple of truth bombs in there and uh, stick a, a couple of jabs with the knife. There's, conservatives really wanted this inquiry. Oh yeah, <sighs> yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. again, we need an inquiry you into for? China into Beijing interference. You, you mean China because Beijing is a city in China. Mm. It's not a country. It's it's a city in China. Say China. Y you can say it. Y you can say it. No. A again. No. So I keep on making the reference, but it's like China doing its Beyonce. Say my name. Say my name. <laughs> it just. Yeah, they they just they just refuse to. It's so absurd. Oh man! And uh, yes, and uh, following the chat, I was reading some while they were talking here. Uh, Kit uh, James mentions, of course, that uh, something with this uh, testimony uh, appears to have some contradictions with the uh, testimony that uh, the Prime Minister's former Chief of Staff, Katie Telford, uh, mm. issued last year when she said uh, she he he reads everything. Now being the debater and devil's advocate that I am this, I can see a scenario where this is where both things can be true and that he reads everything that is given to him to read, but not necessarily everything that is produced for him. Right. Right. Um, that might be the things like I, so I don't believe I had to explicitly state this, but since <laughs> like this, let's make it clear because often it's that that happens too. You know, we take a little, couple of verbal shortcuts, and uh, you know, so we'll see. But yes, it is a question that has arisen, and it is a question that does require an answer. Oh yeah, yep, absolutely. Because these, uh, this is not exactly the same thing, but the point. The point of the Prime Minister saying this, if you really want to be sure that information you need to know got to me, actually gets to me, the best way is to not just write it down and hand it to somebody to give to me, to me like this and hope that there's going to be a time or a hole in the day where I'm going to be able to sit down and read it, where, where I don't have a day that where things go crazy. It's to stop me in my day, either on a secure line face to face you need to hear this which is not unreasonable when you consider all the files that are all happening and everything that the prime minister needs to do and all the meetings with dignitaries and all that type of stuff and just all the places that you're going to be in one day your schedule is down to the minute you know, like this and you're off to often multitasking you're at one event, you're shaking hands, whatnot, and then you get into the car, and in the car you're being briefed on your, on your on your on your way to the next thing, and if in between the time that you were at that event, you get in the and you get back in that, you get out of that car to be in that event and get in the car. If something happens somewhere in the world that you need to respond to, yeah, uh, what was what you what, what you were planning to do for that next fifteen it's minutes in the car on the right changes. elsewhere, that's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Well, and that's if, if there was a document there you needed to read, but something came up and put it to the bottom of the pile, that document doesn't get read at that time. And, also and then that's consider. how people get caught with their pants down uh -huh. when they get uh -huh. asked, asked a question by, by the media in the scrum. Sorry, Mr. Grizzly. Well, you know, you have to also consider that, you know, okay, he's going on vacation for two weeks. That can get cut short while he's on route. You know, when you're in that position, when you have that job, you are on call 24-7, 365 for the entire duration. Yeah, it's your downtime. Guess what? You might be asleep on vacation. You just landed. You went out. You had some dinner. You went to bed. Boom. You're up. You're back on a plane coming home. That's you live how at the, it works. 
You live at the mercy of global crises. Period. Period. You and just that's, do. That's how it is. That's that's why I left my my current my my first job as a communication strategist because I was living at the mercy of other people's crises. I've Where are you going? I'm going to dinner with my friend. No, you're not. <laughs> I've had friends who have been in that same situation and just said, I can't do this anymore. My wife will leave me. Yeah. I will lose my family because it is ever demanding. Look, if you're going to get into that line of work, as evidenced by what has recently happened to the prime minister's relationship, his marriage, if you're going to get into that line of work, you're better off if you're single and have no life. Because that is your life the entire time you were in that position. Yeah. That's it. There, there is nothing else. It's the job. And, you know, I get how people complain, well, they just got a raise. Yeah, I, I think it's a bad choice to do that right now. Yeah. It really is bad. Yeah. Horrible. They should have yep. went in and sat down and said, maybe we shouldn't do this right now, guys. They took the raise anyway. I get it. The golden parachute for their, their pension fully indexed, fully funded, blah, blah, blah. I don't have an issue with that because if you serve, what is it, six years? Uh, yes, six years. Six years to get the pension. That is six years of your life that you have given up in service of the country. And it's precarious employment. Very much so. So I don't have an issue with, uh, at all, with the pension. Not at all. The most recent raise, ah, you should have voted that one down. Yeah. Get it. Everybody needs and wants more money, but you're already living a pretty comfortable life. Yeah. And there's millions of Canadians who aren't. So yeah. Are you taking more? They, they, they could have took, they could have taken an index to inflation. It, that's it. And that's right? it. That's yeah. it. And even then, and even then, but, come on, come on. I mean, but what's again, the average I mean, salary? Like, hundred and yeah, that, that, that's what I mean. Like, even then, but then you, you know, you don't want to create special classes of uh, no, 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 of exclusion. course not. But so, but yes, you know, I, yes, they, 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 they did have the option to say, no, not this time we're full. Yes. <laughs> this is what they, should have done. They, they really but, should have done. And, and again, that. out, out of all of them, the conservatives, Preaching about affordability, preaching about blowing the budget. Shouldn't about they be like the first ones to stand up and say no? They should be the first ones that they should be leading by example. But as we keep on saying on the show, conservatives always say no, no, no. But they always take the dough. Always take the dough. <laughs> I mean, that's it's that simple. No, you shouldn't. Canadians are suffering. Why did you take a $15,000 raise then? Well, 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 that's different. Well, no, I, just, I work very hard for that money. Yeah, I, I don't I have question to over, that. I have to. It's hard work overseeing the suffering. I don't. Yeah, that's what it boils down to. <laughs> right. I don't question the fact that they work very hard for the money, but to take a huge raise when people are, as they keep saying, record food bank usage, which, by the way, maybe for this year, but not overall, food bank usage in the 80s was even higher. Hmm. When they mm -hmm. first brought them in, food bank usage was higher than, than it is today. I just read a, a stat about that yesterday, and I was like, yeah, I think that's a reasonable statement. The 80s, we had some horrible recessions, and it was 1987 when we had the stock market crash. You remember that Black Monday? Yep, yep, yep. yep. Ooh, yeah. Right? That yep. was the biggest crash since 29, and it was bigger than 1929. Yes. But there were... When they, give the day, when they give the day a name, you know, it's bad. Yeah. It, it was bigger than the 29 market crash, but yeah. they, it's from 29 till that time, they had put in things that would prevent the same sort of thing from happening right. to the same degree. But in 87, a lot of people lost their jobs across Canada and the U.S. and throughout Europe. It, you know, financial markets crash, the little guy suffers the most. Yep. As evidenced by the 2008 financial crisis, one person went to jail in Iceland. One. One person. All the big bankers, all the big finance companies in the United States of America, I don't know how much in Canada. I'm sure there was some too. They all kept their jobs and they all got their bonuses. And we paid for it. Uh, yeah. so, so welfare, social programs for the wealthy, rugged individualism for the rest of us. Yeah, indeed.
you 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 named it. Um, oh, and, and, of, and, and, and what Saucy or uh, Rian, Rian uh, Saucy Seawitch is saying here, the money is a distraction. It's bad optics for them, but hardly the main problem we have. Corporations are an issue with their CEOs raking in millions while paying their staff pennies. Completely agree. Completely agree. No argument. We, we need to try and rein that in as well. But in this instance, I think taking a pay rise on the public's dime when, you know, the conservatives keep railing on about Canadians are suffering. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? We'll take the money. We'll take the money. Shh, shh, I'll take the money. Like, here's an envelope full of cash. It's effectively what took place. Yep. Effectively. Effectively. Telling, you know, people are suffering across the country. What are you going to do to, to lower food prices and make houses more affordable and, and do things to make people not have to go to the food bank? Uh, well... We're going to do everything we can, but why are, why, 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 why didn't you refuse this raise? If you really want to put your money where your mouth is, don't take this raise. You can, you can refuse it. You can. And if you've been there for six years, you're going to have the golden parachute. So refuse the raise. You have an operational budget for your office. You are paid a very good living. And if you are from outside of this region, guess what? Your housing is taken care of too. So what do you pay for? Food, drink, and uh, clothing? Although the clothing, I think there's a budget for that too, correct me I if I'm wrong? I believe there's a budget for that. Yes. Yeah. So what are you paying for? Food and drink. Because your housing costs, which would in, in turn incur uh, hydro, uh, internet, uh, all the things you need, that's all covered. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. And a lot of food and drink is covered too. Yes, it is actually. A lot of it is covered. Conferences and meetings and whatnot and food is served. And Trust me, if you're in that position, you never go hungry. Never. You never go hungry. And it's weird how, and I see this firsthand a lot of times, where people who earn a tremendous amount of money get all the free shit. Free yep. food, free drinks, free... Why are we, why are we giving these things to people who don't? Give an award at the Oscars, get your swag bag. Which is worth sometimes up to $2 million. Why are we giving wealthy people free shit? There's guys who are just two blocks from my house who live on the street. Can't we put them in? We can't afford to do it. But you just, you just had a, a gigantic dinner for people who were paid a lot of money and it was free for them. Do, do you not, I, I understand how business works. I understand this needs to take place, but don't tell me we don't have the money. Don't tell me that because we damn well do. Yes. We're just choosing to spend it differently. That's all it is. That's all it is. Keeping people in poverty is a choice. And that is a fact. And Dan, I know you can speak to that. You've seen it firsthand. Keeping people down is a political choice and every party is guilty of it. Nobody's innocent when it comes to that. Every party is guilty because nobody's ever done enough. And I don't know if that's ever going to change. I really don't. Until we can uh, 3D print food that costs us next to nothing, until we can get to those, you know, Star Trek type scenarios, money is still going to rule this world. Mm -hmm. But what happens when when millions of jobs disappear to AI and robotics, as we've talked about on this show many times, what happens then? If we don't have a UBI, nobody's going to be able to buy your products, <laughs> right? And that is happening. Yep. It's, it, it, this is not conspiracy theory. It is happening. It's been going on for years. And with the way AI is advancing at a breakneck speed, I have friends who've said within five years, my job won't exist. I was talking to my buddy. He's a programmer. I was talking to him about that the other day. He goes, I, I think that's even limited down to three right now. And he goes, in the way AI is advancing, I might be out of a contract in the next 18 months. Jeez. <sighs> right? I mean, this, this is a guy who, who programs. I've, I have friends who work in, in CBSA. You know how many frontline workers you greet in the airport now? Used to be a fleet of them, right? You had right. all these booths. Now you just go up to a kiosk. It's like an ATM. And there's, they, they'll have four or five people there, if that. I mean, it, it, people's jobs are disappearing because of AI and automation. Robotics is next. 
I'm not joking. I'm not being alarmist. I'm speaking simple truths here. Yep. So what are we going to do? I don't know. But poverty is a business. Like you say, Dan, poverty is a business. Full stop. You get rid of shelters, food bank, then all those jobs go away and politicians will piss off unions. And we all know that will never happen. Indeed. I completely agree with you, uh, Mr. Grizzly, on this. That was uh, very well stated. Oh, thank you. Very well stated. Every now and then I have a moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there was some uh, questions going on in the, the chat earlier on as the, the show was going on about uh, Mr. Hang Dong. Uh, for those wondering, uh, yes, he's still an MP. He's sitting as an independent member. He's yes. not part of the Liberal Caucus. And uh, for those wondering, yes, he did uh, indeed launch a lawsuit. Uh, I believe it was, according to what I have here, April 20th, 2023. He uh, launched a lawsuit seeking $15 million in damages from Global News over articles alleging he was a witting participant in a Beijing-backed foreign interference network. Um, yeah. The statement of claim provided by Dong's legal team accuses Global of publishing, quote, a series of false, malicious, irresponsible, and defamatory stories about the MP. So that's happened. So yes, and I don't know where the legal action is at the at the present moment. It might still be in, the, in preliminary stages. Uh, although it's we're closing in on a year, so there must have been something that must have been happening until now, but probably hasn't got the coverage yet because it hasn't been uh, substantial. But yes, for those wondering that, uh, that's the case. And then uh, Kit James was talking about uh, specifically the uh, line of questioning from the, the member of uh, the Sikh organization who is asking about uh, the Prime Minister's uh, ability or willingness to push back on uh, certain... Uh, redactions being made in the document and uh, kid james i believe quite accurately states is that they do have the authority to push back but they don't use it no. and that's probably a safe um, um a safe posture to take uh, you know just because you have a power and ability doesn't mean you should use it just because there's something yeah, just because there's something doesn't mean you should right yeah that also applies to fashion, by the way. I can wear a thong to work. <laughs> but should you? <laughs> no. Not if I want to stay employed. <laughs> when is no pants day? That's coming up pretty soon, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know when. I'd have to look that one I up. I think it's in April. I could be wrong. International so, no pants day, then there's the naked bike ride. Right? Yeah. I'm not doing the naked bike ride. Not because I have a fear of being naked in public. Not that at all. You ever seen a bicycle seat and man's anatomy? Not a good idea. Mm, no. Not a good idea. Bicycle seats to begin with are a bad idea for men. You shouldn't be on a bike seat for any lengthy time period because it nerves and you will, ha you will have to take a little blue pill eventually if you ride your bike too much, even at a young age. Fact. <laughs> there so, we go. Uh, Helpful hints. Uh, when I'm at the gym, I use the recumbent bike. Oh, Yes. Which, because it's a chair you're sitting on and your legs yes. are, you know, right? I use the recumbent bike for that reason. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, so just to finish off the the point with the the the, the, the council for the, the sick organization is that, um, yes, as uh, Kid James says, they, may, they have the ability to use it and they don't use it. And that's probably a very smart press, a smart thing to do as a, as a, a common practice uh, and a standard operating procedure. Because at that point, once you start making, the, once you start deciding that you're going to play the arbiter of when it is that uh, you push back on the, on redactions and uh, well, sorry, when you start to take control of what what's being redacted or not, rather than leaving it to an in independent group, uh, that's when you open the door to a whole bunch more questions. Because oh, if God, you yeah. redacted or did not redact the right or wrong thing, um, that could be career ending. So just it's better just not to fish in that pond at all in the first place. Just there's no need. <laughs> uh, there you go. Um, yes, Kit Cassie's going. That was a smooth move by the PM to include that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm glad I'm not the only one who thought so. Uh, okay, this has nothing to do with inquiry, but I think it's great. Uh, Ms. Shattuck says, can we get Paul and Douglas to each take turns saying sweaty balls in their best character voices? Oh, dude, I got to change my microphone. 
Yes, I'm sure you will very much like my sweaty balls. Uh, <laughs> peach sweaty. And uh, whenever you try them, they're, they're a delightful thing. Once you get it in your mouth, you're really going to enjoy it. How was that? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> You've all seen that clip, right? Peach sweaty. Yes. Oh, my God. Sweaty, ball, sweaty wiener. <laughs> there's, there's nothing quite like the look on a child's face when he gets his first hot sweaty wiener in his mouth oh that's horrible that's what they did. that was literally in the skit i'm like <laughs> the way they did it i'm like how did they get that one past the censors my goodness but they did it and it's funny oh my god so I was at home, you see, washing my sweaty balls, you see. <laughs> hey, Pete's in the chat. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Pete, how you that, doing, mate? That's my best character voice for sweaty balls. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, I've got something here. Hang on, hang on. Oh, my goodness gracious. Look at this. No matter what the nation states try, the globalists will dominate a group of globalist billionaires. The World Economic Forum is a globalist organization of the UN to penetrate governments. We will ban all of my ministers and top government officials from any involvement in the World Economic Forum. And out of that, they will call for central bank digital currencies to be rolled out. The central bank. Uh, is now pr promoting a, pr a possible proposal to bring in a digital currency. You get the internet ID, that's then tied to your digital global ID that tracks everywhere you go, what you do, what you buy. I'll answer your question. I will never allow the government to impose a digital ID. Yeah. 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 No matter what the nation states try. So um, look where he gets his talking points. Hmm. And that was, that was a, a tweeted by the Liberal Party of Canada. Pierre Polyev is ripping a page out of the far-right American handbook. No wonder conspiracy theorist Alex Jones endorsed him. Interesting, eh? Mm -hmm. And our friend Mike, Mark Gerritsen, mm -hmm. Canada doesn't need Alex Jones' protege. I'm like, they're really going for the throat on this one. And I am here for it. Uh, yeah. Damn, where'd I put my popcorn? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, Did you like okay. the breaking news thing? I just created that earlier. I, I like. Uh, you know what? I I like the sound of it, mm -hmm. but something's been happening on my restream that, like, the opening credit sequence and whatnot, nothing happens. I have just the like sort of the thing that oh, the black yeah. background whatnot that just stays there until it's open, and then you pop up. So I didn't get to see it. I'm gonna have to catch it on the, the on actual YouTube afterwards. Well, the reason the reason when that happens, the reason that happens is that it's pl it's running smoothly online. And yep. your computer is compensating. The guy, you don't need to see this. We'll throw that out. You can hear the music. Yeah. The video is going to, you know, so it, it, that's, that's, that's how the system keeps operating smoothly. That's, it does yep. that by choice. Yep. I'm just going to have to, yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just looking at some comments there from the kids, but yeah, yeah, that's uh so I didn't get to see it, but uh, I was wondering what that was and, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Yes. Groovy graphics are Thank you. making me happy. <laughs> you know, and then something will come across my feed quickly and I thought wouldn't it be fun if we had something like that to just you know breaking news <laughs> so I, I you know I was up very early so I thought I created it this morning ah uh, right cool stuff uh, you said that uh, Kit Pete came in yeah he's right here okay he us. hey there my friend nice to see you I'm still behind on the, on the, the chat here okay. trying to figure out well, what, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to wrap it up uh, sir i have a meeting absolutely and i have to get to shortly uh what time right. actually let me just check my calendar here yeah in about 20 minutes i got a meeting so let's uh let's wrap it up now so i can prep for it and excellent we can uh, get get uh the rest of our day going and our weekend started all right kids and cubs uh we hope that you love this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show, when our special deep dive into the Prime Minister's testimony at uh, the Foreign Interference uh, Public Commission. Uh, as you can see, and as I saw from uh, some uh, comments in the, in the in the chat, that uh, uh, people like this posture mm -hmm. from the Prime Minister. 
uh, find it to, to make him look a uh, statesman like. Yes. And, uh, the, you know, they think he uh, should maybe engage in this a little more often. Uh, so far, the, any opportunity that the prime minister has had to testify for certain things, he's always come out looking pretty good. So, uh, uh, makes one wonder what Jeff would look like on the stand. Of course, he oh, can't take the stand because he's not privy to the information because he's not Nissy Cop cleared and he refuses to get it. Why is that? He keeps saying, because then the, the prime minister can just say, this is Nissy Klopp and I can't speak about it. So you can't rage fire him off state secrets. You're not supposed to. <sighs> Indeed. Well, uh, somebody actually uh, produced an answer to your question, actually, uh, Mr. Oh. Grizzly. I remember seeing this tweet yesterday, what it would have been like. Whoops. Oh, what happened there? Sorry. <laughs> there we go. go. Okay. Can you tell? I don't know. Can I? Sir, please tell the committee when well, you Hold on, that. let's start let's start at the beginning. Okay. I'll read the first oh. one. You you read the response. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Polyev, can you tell the committee? Uh, I don't know. I, I I can. I don't know, can I? Sir, I'm having a hard time seeing that. Let me pull it up. <laughs> there we go. As he bites an apple. Sir, please tell the committee when you knew that that global warming's a hoax. Eats a eats hand. A hand. No, when you knew that Turdo is a wef woke uh, plant. <laughs> Sucks kumquats. <laughs> well, and from Don Cochran, right? I, yes. I can't help but think how different a witness Polyev would be. The PM is articulate, thoughtful, polite. He understands the big picture of global uh, diplomacy. He understands the role of foreign uh, reps and when the line is crossed between what is acceptable and what isn't. I mean love to be able to see him on that stand but he can't because he doesn't have the clearance to see the documentation that's required to make a, an informed comment indeed 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 so there you go so that's how you, live from from the beaver lodge we show you exactly how it would have gone down in the alternate universe mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, please tell your peeps and poops all about us because sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless so when you tell people about us it uh, means uh, an extra little bit of special to us so uh, thank you so much if you would like to support us make like kit elaine and go to our youtube page uh true north eager beaver media incorporated and click our buttons like share subscribe and if you do not want to miss an episode you don't have to thanks to the ray girl if you scan that qr code that's just appeared under my chin or go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words and when you click subscribe there when we have something fresh off the bandwidth it comes directly to you finally uh given it's the end of the week and it's time to party if you'd like to help us do that a little bit well there's the eager beaver lodge emergency hydration fund where you can help your favorite beaver grizzly combo remain moist throughout the entire weekend so that we can come back to you strong on monday with a great show so if you are like what we do and like to encourage us to do more if you scan that tech qr code or if you go to coffee ko-fi.com slash eager beaver lowercase letters all in one word and you would like to make a contribution there thank you so much we are very grateful everything goes back into the show and of course the gift of your attention is the one that we cherish the most so uh, thank you for all of that because democracy is something that you do please write to those letters very 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 important and from the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there. So please be kind to and very gentle with yourself. Also, uh, thank you to Mademoiselle Fox for having me uh, as a guest last night. It was good. Oh, fun and friendly feminist conversations. I had a wonderful time. Uh, if it's a show you're not following yet, uh, please look it up on uh, Mademoiselle Fox's YouTube channel. Uh, I believe it is called Mademoiselle Fox, right? I will pull it up. Uh, let me just second. All right. Because uh, it's always it's always good to give encouragement to people who are uh, starting out. Yeah, and, 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 you know, it's it's uh, the reason she started and and talked to me about wanting to start a podcast and a YouTube channel. And she says, "Look, I love what you, you guys do, but uh, we're not getting enough women's voices." And I'm like, yeah, because I, you know, I, I will monitor chats from not necessarily our show, 
because we're live and I'll peek in, but I, I, other programs I see where they're like, could we get some women on? Could we get the women's? Because our uh, we're not giving necessarily a male perspective on what we're talking about. Because we're, we, we curate the news and deliver it to you. You'll get opinions, but it's not really that a man thing that we're doing per se. Mm -hmm. But we do have uh, female correspondents. Mm -hmm. High Tide Hilda being one. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to 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 queue up a couple in Alberta, and a friend in British Columbia. Uh, just it's, some people are. You, the folks I'm talking about are used to being behind the camera, so getting in front of it is a little bit of a stumbling block for them. So yeah, no, Mademoiselle Fox wanted to start a channel for fun and feminist conversations, and and where women come and have a safe space to have a chat about whatever is in their mind. Yeah, James is correct. Fifty percent of Casual Friday is female, so you know. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Don't we? We we need that. And uh, Kit James, uh, I don't know why you said "bless you, Douglas," but I've heard a lot about your uh, show with a reality winner. If people That's haven't good. listened to it yet, uh, please take some time to look at the uh, listen to the blackballed episode with a reality winner, which is what I will be doing uh, after I sign off here because uh, I definitely do not want to miss it. I love it uh, when uh, James does uh, this type of thing because uh, there's pretty much no one better. Agreed. Pretty much no one better. Yeah. Uh, all right. So that's everything I have. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? Words of wisdom. Uh, yeah. Do your best today. Do your best for you today. Whether that means you go out and have a cup of coffee, you have a conversation with a friend or a loved one, or you just sit in silence for as long as you need. Do something for yourself today. Because we ask you to do something for your community and your neighborhood all the time. But occasionally you need to do something for yourself and it's important for self-care and self-love. And I, I, I really do mean that. If you have a chance to do something good for yourself today, you pick what it is. It's, I'm not going to decide. You know what you need best. Do something for yourself today. I think it's important that we do that from time to time. Mm. I see Kit Toronto Dan's going to eat a Kit Kat for breakfast. There you go. <laughs> you know, stuff like that in moderation isn't going to kill you. Uh, now I hear you the Oreos. That's, that's, you know. <laughs> now I hear the Oreos in the kitchen cabinet calling me. Mm. <laughs> Kit Cassie, only in the Beaver Lodge would we go from federal commission testimony to discussing shorty balls. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, no. All right, Mr. Chrisley, please roll the credits. Mwah. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. Somehow you're blurred. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. I have no I have no idea what happened there. I'm like, is it my I'm like, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nope. No, it's not I don't weird. know what happened. Yeah, uh, your autofocus seems to have unautoed. I don't know. Well, <sighs> yeah. Anyway. <sighs> I don't I don't really have a I don't really have a uh, oh I do actually I do have something. I do have something for you. Um, Please do. It's it's uh, it's a yikes. I'm gonna put the link in the chat, and I'm gonna just read you a, a tweet, and I'll read the tweet, and then you can go and investigate this article. This article is a year old, but this is Thomas Nukazuk, 
I think I pronounced his name correctly. It's at L-U-K-A-Z, A-S-Z-U-K, capital A, capital B. Thomas A. Lukasuk. Uh, I hope I pronounced his name correctly. Lukasuk, maybe? Lukasuk, maybe. Um, former Deputy Premier, Cabinet Minister. Uh, oh, guess him. Okay, so he says, Alberta UCP, this is wild. All Albertans must read this. UPC set, or UCP sorry, set up a web of numbered companies in the USA with UCP current cabinet ministers as directors. Unpaid US taxes, strange transactions, $7 billion, no, $7 million, my apologies, $7 million administration fees. This isn't normal. And here is a link to the story from the Narwhal that I just placed in the chat if anybody Whoa. wants to read up on that. Yeah, there's some nefarious things happening there. Nefarious, to say the least. It's like... What's the title of the article? Uh, the title of the article is um, Alberta is suing the U.S. over Keystone XL. The province just has to pay its American taxes first. Oh, okay. <laughs> Easy. Jeez. Yeah. Talk about leaving us with a cliffhanger for the weekend. Well, you know, I gave you some reading there, so do what you want with that. All right. I'll see Excellent. you. Oh, oh, I see Pete. You're going to call me after this. All right. Yes, I'll be waiting for your call. All right. I'll see you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye. I just remembered. Just before we leave, twentieth, uh, April twentieth, next Saturday, our podcast. Yeah. Uh, I think we could do that. Yeah, it's going to be done at a different location this time, um, and we're going to start at three in the afternoon. It's going to start a little bit later at a different location, just because we're going to have some musical guests that we'll interview and we'll show a couple of songs before we bow out around a little after eight p.m. So, well, maybe we'll start at four. Let's start at four. We'll do a four hour show for okay. four hours, 15 minutes sort of thing. Cause we'll get in, we'll, we'll have our chat. We'll, we'll interview some of the folks and it'll be a slightly different uh, podcast, but still a podcast nonetheless. Okay. So next Saturday, April 20th, just letting y'all know. All right. I really will see you this time. Okay.